So welcome to the data quality session. Uh, what we're going to do in this session is we're going to have a number of presentations on some data quality initiatives going on around the world. Um, and we're also going to give you a bit of an update on what we are doing at UIO for data quality support. And so I'll give us a quick introduction. And for the sake of time, I'm going to cut my 10 minutes down to five. And then we're going to have coffee from uh, HIST Western Central Africa come in and give us a presentation on their um, data quality support and supervision apps. And then uh, Reddit from Ethiopia will be giving a presentation. Unfortunately, he couldn't get his visa last minute, but what he has to say, I think is gonna be really interesting. So we're gonna have him join virtually and present. And then John Painter from CDC PMI will come in and give us an update on his Magic Glasses app. And then finally, Shurji and Ulav are gonna round us out with a bit of an update from the UIO side on data quality. A real quick note on kind of the broader strategy for data quality. If you've been in any of my other presentations, you've heard me say that data quality is all of our problems. It's not just one person. Everyone in an information system who touches the information system has to be concerned with data quality. If that's not the case, then we've just seen that most people will just be plagued by poor data quality. Data quality problems are a fact of life. You will have data quality issues. It is not a failure of the information system to have data quality issues. It is a failure of the of those implementing the information system to allow data quality issues to persist, right? We just have to accept the data quality issues will be there and that we have to have the tools and the strategies to continuously address them. There is no way to get rid of data quality issues 100%. They're going to happen. So what are we doing on the UIO side to try to support all DHIS2 implementations for data quality? Well, a few things. First, and this is after a lot of research, a lot of trial and error, um, a lot of best practices over many, many years, we are trying to make sure that the data quality checks, procedures, support, tools that we produce in DHIS2 are able to be used at the lowest level. We've seen that getting data quality checks down to those individuals who are usually producing the data quality errors in the first place is a very good strategy. Many countries struggle with actually fixing problems, right? And I can name a few countries, uh, I won't, but you know, the data quality to fix a problem in one country that we work quite closely with basically requires an act, you know, like a, 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 the, the president to sign off on, a, on something, right? The data comes in, it gets locked, and then you perform your data quality checks, you find tons of outliers, which is seemingly inevitable, and then you can't actually change it because of protocols, procedures, or you don't actually even know who produced the problem. You don't have any way of contacting them to change it, right? Um, so what we're trying to do is make sure that you have the tools, you have kind of the guidance to drive those, drive those data quality checks down to as low a level as you can possibly get them. And we encourage you to update your protocols and procedures to allow those at district level, sub-district level, facility level to do their data quality checks, be empowered to actually perform their own data quality analysis. The other thing is we want to make sure that the data quality, that DHIS2 is smart enough to detect many of the data quality issues that are very common, like outliers, like validation rule analysis, and alert you to them. We know that passive observation of data quality is nothing, essentially. If you're not being alerted or notified of data quality issues, by and large, you're not going to do anything about it. Um, you know, we see many countries that have massive outliers persisting in their database for like five, 10 years. You know, they were visible on a dashboard the whole time, very easily, but because maybe the right person didn't receive an alert, wasn't clued into it. They've just been sitting there throwing off national statistics for, you know, for a long time. So we want to make sure that the data quality alerts are automated and they're coming to you. And specifically what I mean by that is DHIS2 can, all of your validation rule alerts and notifications, checks can be automated and sent to you via an email, via WhatsApp message, who has, or an SMS message, who's using automated validation rule notification? Alerts. Anybody? Okay. One person. <laughs> that functionality, yeah, two. Thank you. Bro. That functionality has been there for seven years, more or less now. 
And it's extremely powerful to have DHIS2 automatically check the data quality for you, run your validation rules, and then just send you a simple list of all of your errors via to your email, right? Um, it's very powerful, but uh, as you pointed out, uh, woefully underutilized. We also have new data quality metrics. We have been a little bit stuck in a rut with some of our tried and true data quality um, uh, metrics, like data set reporting rates, for example. We know through a lot of research that data set reporting rates are not very useful to actually assessing real data quality. And so how many of you are using, are looking at your data set reporting rates? Probably most people, it's pretty standard. But we know that many countries, what is actually happening is you've, you put in very strict standard operating procedures to make sure the data comes in on time, but you haven't put in equally st uh, strict standard operating procedures to make sure that the data that is actually coming in. Because remember on, on DHIS2, you can open up your data set, mark it complete, and then that counts for the reporting rate without filling in any data. And there are some countries that have um, made it very, you know, they, they do um, uh, performance-based financing. So if you don't send your data in on time, if you don't mark that complete button on time, then you don't receive money. But then no, no one's actually looking at the data. And so they're just filling out blanks or they're just making up numbers. And then they'll say, I'll go in and fix it later. We see that to be extremely common and somewhat tragic. So um, we have new data quality metrics that we will introduce a little bit now, but the session immediately after this on indicators, we will go into these new metrics uh, in, in a lot of detail to the point that we're showing you how they're actually configured and you know, going through the conditional uh, and expressions, the conditional statements and the expressions that you actually program into uh, predictors and indicators to actually calculate some of these metrics. But these metrics um, uh, are there to give you a better indication of, is my data quality, is, and more importantly, is my data even usable? Like, can I even have confidence in my data so that I can say that this KPI is getting better or worse? Because by and large, because of data quality issues, the, a lot of the data that's sitting in DHIS2 is just not usable, right? You can't say with any confidence that your things are getting better or worse because you have so many outliers, you have so many gaps in your data not necessarily talking about you specifically, but it's kind of the general DHIS2 community, right? Um, and there's tons of research on this saying the data is not actually that usable because we actually went in and looked at the data quality and they said things were getting better, but they really don't know because there's so many gaps in the data and there's so many outliers skewing the, 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 uh, the impact indicators. So what we've worked uh, with quite a few partners on is coming up with new metrics that actually tell us, can we use this data and in the session after that, Jim and I will be going through how some of those are configured. All right. Then we also want to um, build a broader community of practice. Again, data quality is everyone's struggle. Um, it will continue to be everyone's struggle. And we want to make sure that you are able to share your experiences, your best practices more broadly with the DHIS2 um, community. If we had as vibrant a community of data quality experts as there is like DHIS2 system admins struggling with program indicator configuration, then we would have much fewer um, much fewer data quality issues as a, as a global community. Nobody's struggling with program indicators. I thought that would get a laugh, but it's fine. Okay. All right. So a, a quick note on some of the advances on some of the data quality advances that we've had. You've seen a few of them, but I'm just going to, uh, in previous presentations, I'm just going to go through a, a quick list here and not do any demonstrations. We have a new WHO data quality report app. Who used to, has anyone used the WHO data quality app tool? Okay, that's not so bad. A few hands. Well, that application was a really good opportunity for to us to learn what kinds of data quality metrics and um, uh, analytics were very um, powerful to actually drive down um, uh, data quality checks to lower levels and have more routine data quality checks. But that app, unfortunately, is not something that we can support. The technology that was powering that app is extremely old. And so we've had to build a new app to replace it. So we have a new app that generates the data quality reports that the old app, the old WHO app 
um, uh, did. So if you're still using the old WHO app, I highly encourage you to transition to the new one. We will no longer be supporting the old one by um, the next release. Um, we have new outlier tables, which I've, which we demoed on Monday and yesterday as well. We have outlier analysis and scatter plots, which I demoed yesterday. We have year over year charts for, inter for internal consistency checks. We have, and again, I mentioned the new data quality metrics that we'll be talking about in the session immediately following this. We also have some new implementation support guidance that Shurjit is gonna come back and give you more details on in just a few minutes. So I'll just let him cover that for the sake of time. So I think with that, we will hand it off to our first presenter, which is Coffee. You ready? Oh, wait, wrong screen. Hello, can you hear me? Um, I'm Kofi from East West and Central Africa. I'm just the spokesperson for a bench of a team uh, members that you've seen on the screen. So I'm happy to share with you our experience about digitalizing uh, supervision in general, but also uh, data quality supervision. Uh, here are the outlines of my presentation. Uh, I, I think you guys are all familiar with the RDQA, or most of you are familiar with the RDQA, which is a uh, set of Excel data, uh, data tool that you can use to check and uh, to report on data quality at the facility level, at the lower level. So this RDQA is a typical tool that is used across countries, and uh, typically it will have three components. The first one, the data quality assessment to see how your data are of quality, how much confidence you can have in your data. The second one is the evaluation of the system that is reporting the data. Who is reporting it? Do we have the materials in place? Do you have internet connection and so on and so forth. And the third one is to develop action plan to strengthen the system and have a, and improve your data quality. That's the typical use of it. And it is usually in the format of an Excel file that you can have on your Windows computer or your MacBook, either one. And then you can go to the field and use it. Uh, the aim is the, to verify the availability of data there at the source point, at the primary source where the data is produced, the registers and so on, but also to check the accuracy of the reported data against what you have in your system at the higher level. And finally, evaluate the six core functions of the HMIS there. And it's used in several countries to report routine data, but also for spot checks. You have these uh, spot checks that are conducted either by the national level, but also by the, the donors, for example, the Global Fund will conduct these spot checks with the LFA and so on. And then it has been in use in several countries, including in Mali, Togo, and DIC, which are the use, use cases for the example we're presenting now. So this Excel sheet has some lim limitations. First of all, data storage. Once you have completed this exercise, then the one that has the data has, uh, has the computer has the data. If this guy moves away, then you have no longer you no longer have your, your data. Secondly, there is no transparency in the selection of the sites where you are going to perform your assessment. So I can randomly select uh, the set where I'm pretty sure that I have good quality data so that I can report and then I can look very shiny and uh, looks like my, my system is very nice. But I can also choose places where I can easily go so that I can I won't be challenged in going where I have problems. But 
this is not what I want to see. I want to see where I have problems. So when I don't have the ability to choose whatever site I want to go, then it's an issue for me. Other, other uh, limitation is about um, following up the recommendations. Once I have issued recommendation, uh, as, as a former health district manager, I've seen that, uh, let's say that I've completed an assessment six months ago, I go back to the same place and I will see the same issues and I will make the same recommendations. And then if I come back uh, six months later, I will, I'm likely to see exactly the same issues, with exactly the same recommendations. So how do I follow up the recommendation uh, over time to make sure that the recommendation that I'm issuing at the end of my supervision are being enforced so that when I come back a few months later, I can see some progresses. Uh, all, all other issue is the lack of overview on emerging issues. If I conduct this assessment in Togo, and then you conduct this in DRC, and another one conducted in Mali, how can we see the emerging issues if we don't have the data all together in the same place so that we can triangulate and see what are the common issues and then address them on, in a regional fashion. So these are some of these limitations that we have seen in this Excel sheet. Uh, so based on this uh, situation, we have tried to digitalize the supervision tools um, using two components. The first one is an application that helps you to manage the supervision in general, including the planning. So it provides you an overview of uh, the site you are going to go, the, 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 the teams you are sending in place, the calendar for this, and also uh, help you to select the indicators that you want to check when you go there. Uh, the second component is the, the tracker app that helps you to uh, uh, use um, structure uh, checklist to check step-by-step uh, whatever uh, feature you want to check there, be it uh, uh, quality of care, be it quality of data. You can verify your, your data, you can assess your system, you can check the recommendation that has been issued way back and see which of them has been enforced and which of them are still, still standing. And you have diverse dashboard that can help you see uh, the, the aggregate results. So here is a view of the calendar that you will have when you are like, let's say you are the program manager at the central level, or you are the, the HMS manager at the regional level. Here is the, the, the calendar you will see. You will see what are the teams that are going to the field? What are the dates to go there? And you have this color code that uh, you can see in blue, what has been planned as supervision, what has been canceled, what is ongoing and what has been completed. And then you can have this nice uh, pie when, where you can see the, the proportion of the, the one that are planned and that are conducted and so on. So here is the, the, the planning app where you can, first of all, go and uh, the first thing you'll do is to see if you want to select randomly the seat, the site or if you want to to run a criteria based choice. So you can decide that, okay, let me go randomly in two facilities in all my districts. So I'll go, uh, I'll, I have three districts to supervise. So I select just randomly two facilities in all these three districts and I'm, I'm going to these places. But I can decide that, uh, decide that okay, I'm gonna see the top five, uh, performers in the, in let's say malaria uh, detection or malaria treatment. And then I will see the three uh, less performers. So I will, I will share, I will, I will put in my, my uh, app, these are the criteria I want to see. Indicator is the, let's say mal malaria testing and treatment. And then I want, I want to see the three top performers and the five that are the less performers. Why I want to see the five? Because I want to choose 
the less performance where I want to go and check what are the problems, what are the issues that are there. And I also want to see the top performers because I want to see what are the good practices that are, are out there that I can learn from and then translate into the other places. So once I've uh, run these criteria, the, at, at uh, the, your, your left side, you see these uh, things uh, that uh, you want to see the one one burst and one worst, for example, and then I'll uh, ask for him to, to, to show me the drop list, which is down there. And then in, in green, you have top performer. And in, uh, I would say red-ish, you have the, 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 the worst performer. So I can have, for example, the three best performers and the five worst performers or whichever. And then in this list, I can choose, okay, I'm going to the three ones or the, I will go to the three worst and then one of the, the best ones. So once I have chosen my sites, I can now assign the teams. So I'll choose, uh, I want Anne to go there with Scott, with Dr. Mania, and then they are, I'm, I'm going to assign the site where I want them to go so that I can have a full view of my team distribution and make sure that they are going where I want to say to send them. And once I have assigned them, I can say, uh, okay, uh, I can see this on my calendar and then see uh, what you have, you have made the teams and then you assign them to the sites and you can plan them. Okay, you guys are going to go there this week and this day and so on. So I have all these on my, my screen. So that uh, supervision tracker, that, that is the part one of my, my app. I have planned my supervision. Then I go on the field and maybe at the field, I don't have internet. Then we have that uh, uh, Android base app, which is uh, offline app that I can go on the field with my, uh, my little fo mobile phone and then I can check. And then I have all these steps Okay, what are the materials that are there? I'll check them. What are the, the people, are they trained? Uh, are they doing the things? And then I can check the different registers. I can check the register. I can check the monthly report and I, check, I can check them against the DHIS2. And then I'll have this nice um, uh, figure there where I see uh, the same uh, indicator coming from different uh, kind of uh, sources. Five minutes, yeah, thanks. So uh, <clears throat> when I, I, I'll see my data entry form, this is the checklist that I have. So for example, I, I want to verify the data. So I'm checking if for indicator one, review available uh, of data source, is it available, yes or no? And then I will check these, all of them. And then at the end of the, the checklist, I'll have these figures that automatically pops up because all the, these data uh, dashboard are configured in the system. At the end of this, I will have all these dashboard and you can have this um, graph where you show the, the, the system, uh, what uh, about the sys component, what are the level of um, uh, appropriateness of these uh, systems. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, this um, app, what are the advantages uh, you have your data that is available at hand, and then you can share it at any time. You can review them and uh, you can uh, get insight of them. We also have the possibility, as I said, to run offloads, uh, offline supervision using the uh, Android uh, features. It is simple. And then you have this intuitive dash dashboard that we were sh showing. You also have an enhanced uh, archiving mechanism that helps you to secure your data and uh, the, the, the result can be used and you can also come back and check how much your uh, recommendation has been uh, enforced and has been put into actions. So this uh, is not just about data, as I said, you can use it for data quality review. You can also use it not only for one program, but for an integrated a supervision program, like if I want to check both vaccination and um, uh, disease surveillance, or I want to check malaria and uh, uh, 
uh, nutrition, for example, then I can do a set of programs together and then check the whole one as an integrated supervision. I can also check the quality of care in a specific uh, supervision, for example, the cascade in HIV, who has been uh, sensitized, who has been tested, who has been put on the treatment, who, who, where the uh, viral, viral load is suppressed and so on. And finally, I can also use it for community uh, health uh, supervision. We've used this in Cote d'Ivoire where we deployed the system for community health worker supervision and we embedded in, in it the, the payment of the supervisors and the community health workers. So that's it. And uh, as I was saying, I'm just a, a spokesman for a team that we have all around here. Thank you. They were really impressed by your app, which they were. How can they use it? We have to say it up to the mic. <laughs> very, very quick one and very important one. You can just email us first. You also have, uh, we have uh, set uh, a demo instance where you can go and play around it and see how it works. And then if you want uh, us, we can uh, organize quickly a meeting and see how we can together partner and see how we can move ahead using it. It's, uh, we'll be very pleased to do so. You can come and see me and my colleagues, Adam, and other ones that are around in the, in the, in the in the in the room thank you yeah okay so we uh for the sake of time we'll just go straight into redis presentation so we stop sharing here yeah can you help me? uh reddit can you share your screen you can go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the Republic Solution for Ethiopia. I'm so unable to be present due to this application. I'm truly allowed to present uh, virtually at the, this prestigious conference. Uh, half of uh, our team is there with you, including Dr. Abiot. Uh, we need to uh, clarify a few things about this. Sorry, Reddit. We uh, we we'll have to interrupt you. We're we're not, you're not coming through very clearly. I don't know if it's us, probably. Uh, or do you I'm have one. a? Sorry, go ahead. So the the topic uh, is improving data quality and Ethiopia's healthcare system using HIS to support the completeness uh, app. And so this is uh, an innovative solution that we have pioneered to address uh, clinical data quality uh, challenge. So to give you a bit of context about Ethiopia's uh, HIS implementation, uh, Ethiopia has undertaken a remarkable uh, nationwide addition of data is over uh, 38,000 uh, from urban hospitals to remote uh, and forces where there is um, this as uh, this strategic deployment has transformed in a good way uh, on how we manage healthcare data uh, data to drive decision making. Uh, so recently, the ministry has undertaken a data version upgrade and uh, with our data revisioning where we um, reduced the duplicate of the external uh, data elements to streamline the data collection uh, process. Uh, however, upon evaluation of, uh, of in-depth evaluation of the persistent content completeness gap, we found at the facility levels where Data still has the ability to know which data sets have been marked as complete, but it, it, it lacks uh, a detailed insight into uh, which of the specific data elements were being filled properly. So the problem was that we have seen a very high completion rate, that's in completeness, 
But when we open up the, the, the individual data sets and look into the values, we have found that most of the data values were not uh, filled or not properly uh, addressed. Uh, Scott was mentioning about performance-based uh, uh, financing where they're using uh, data, uh, data completeness report to finance the facilities. Well, if they if we do that, they would just mark their data, the data set as complete, and then their their individual data elements would be uh, empty or left out. So the, those data elements are very essential that we want them to be, that's why they are included in the data set themselves. And so uh, this has created a gap in understanding the true level uh, of the completeness level at the, uh, of the data set. So, and hence this has uh, uh, hindered the, the data quality, uh, accurate data collection and reporting for the stream level. So, in order to address those issues, uh, we have to first uh, articulate what with the problem we have, uh, especially at the facility, and come up with an innovative uh, content completeness application uh, to address those challenges. So, as a requirement, we uh, we say now to that the app has to have uh, has to scrutinize the proportion of assigned data elements and. The advocate linked ones. And this has to offer a detailed insight into uh, uh, whether the, the data sets have been properly built or not. And so the content completeness application uh, is introduced. Uh, so th this is a DHS application, meaning that you have a DHS instance to be able to validate and run. And so it works by going through each of The dots of basics, and from that we uh, it calculates the content completeness rate, and that content completeness rate is used to generate a report, which it would then be used to create a corrective measure that would be taken by the user. So to go through it uh, further, uh, the first step would be to uh, get the information from the users, get the dimensions, and apply filters, and then from that we calculate the content completeness rate. And then from the content completeness rate, we generate the report, and the report will be used to take uh, the actions. Uh, the data set, the where dimensions, or unit, and the period. Uh, here we have the ability to select multiple org units as well as the period. And for filters, uh, based on the user selection, uh, the app automatically sends an API request for organic uh, group sets, and from there we will pull all the uh, organic group sets as for applying for filters. So in Ethiopian uh, implementation, we have around eight uh, groups, uh, some of which are facility type with ownership. And so this is the uh, screenshot of the content of this application. As you see on the left, uh, there are organic selected. Uh, and in the middle, you can see it's like a local option where you can select uh, the data set. And from there, depending on the period type, uh, it will allow us to generate the periods. The period you see here is an Ethiopian uh, uh, period. That's why you see, uh, that's why it's very different from the ones that you're used to. So once you've selected that, we have an option to include children, which means that if you want to calculate the uh, on the company, or the ones that are selected on the organic, not including the uh, the sub children, you would then check this one. If you check this, it would do the aggregation for all the ones that are selected organic. Uh, the others are the features. Uh, the features are by say the area, they are uh, organic group set, and the options are directly dropped from the organic group set values. So once the user click on the generate report, uh, the content completeness rate would be calculated. So the content completeness rate is the number of data elements that are properly filled over the ones that are expected to be filled. So when doing this, we have to consider the attribute option combinations, attribute uh, as well as the category team option combinations, uh, which would affect the, the expected numbers as well as the the grade the grade or disability changes that would be uh, would not that would not be included in the uh, expected values. 
So the next one is to organize this uh, uh, form and generate uh, it for the user. This is a sample uh, uh, report. As you can see here, there are multiple organites and very select and their bottom this value is uh, reported as such. Uh, you see here, this is just a sample, uh, sample data. For example, at this Katamasa city, for this period, it has only 5% of the rate for the selected uh, data set, which is where database plan aggregate. And so you not only have, this is a, just a report, so using the report is uh, very important. So using it to take action, uh, for example, making them why the facilities uh, are reporting a very low content completeness rate is essential. And that's where uh, the, we'll see a, a good result. Uh, we'll be to the main results. Uh, the app was tested by uh, DHS experts from all regions of Ethiopia. And we have used, we have received a positive feedback and strong approval for the use, uh, which would enhance the data quality efforts by addressing the content completeness uh, issue and, and hence enabling uh, decision making. Um, so the implementation is a part of the state owned uh, DHS implementation. Uh, we have completed pilot testing the stage uh, to be rolled out for 30,000 facilities. And by the end of June this year, along with the updated project version, it will be deployed uh, for over uh, 8,800 uh, 8, uh, hospitals in 3,800 uh, centers. In uh, 7800 clinics and over 80,000 health posts. So this app uh, will address the critical uh, data quality challenge in Ethiopia. Uh, we, have, we have seen it as a potential for profound impact for data quality, data crazy, uh, decision making, and the process of migration. Throughout the process, we have uh, a local capacity for uh, developing apps and custom solutions for uh, DHS to end we have plans to contribute to the DHS community. If you want to uh, know, if you want to get the source code for this app as well as other open source apps that are developed by Haptic Solution, get it over to github.com uh, slash Haptic. So thank you. Well. I don't know if you can hear, but they were, everyone was applauding. So thank you. Um, and I think to drive home some of those points, John, you're up next. I think you're uh, you're hopefully starting to pick up on a theme that data set reporting rates are not reliable metric for data quality. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Hi. Um, so the Magic Glasses, it's referred to here, is an app that I developed that was really for evaluating a, a program, impact of a program. And in talking with, with Scott and some others, we realized that there was sort of another application of it, and I want to touch on that today, and that's uh, looking at data quality. And... Mouse. There you go. Yeah. Um, so one of the big issues people ask is, because everyone's interested in data quality, has data quality improved? And then I would always ask, well, when is it good enough? Because if you're always saying that, well, well we're going to improve, we're going to improve it, it gives the impression that it's perhaps not good enough. And then some people say, well, well yeah, okay, there's issues, but can we just use the data as it is? There are uh, already some you know, guidelines out there. WHO has made this uh, nice series of booklets about using routine data um, and how to look at it. But that by itself doesn't sometimes give you the practical indexes that you might want to be able to say, okay, is my data good enough? So I want to uh, start with an example that for those of you who saw my talk last year may have seen. I just want to repeat this because it brings home 
this uh, repeated idea of problem with, with re reporting. So this is uh, malaria data from uh, one of the countries that's supported by the, the PMI, the Presence of Malaria Initiative. And you notice here uh, for a, a district, we took out the values of the first attendances, those that the number that had suspected malaria, number that were tested for malaria, and the number that were confirmed malaria. These are typically the data that one would use to evaluate a program. So if you use that data to evaluate the program, you'd look at what percentage of patients were suspected of malaria. And in an endemic malaria country, that's quite low, casting some doubt about whether or not the providers were sufficiently uh, looking for uh, malaria. And then, okay, if they did suspect malaria, were they tested, which is a critical component of, of our programs? 35% in area where this is our main interest is, is, is uh, uh, critically low. And then of those that were tested, if this data would suggest that 126% were positive. So uh, what do you draw from that, using that data as is? Well, the likely conclusion is that this program is seriously underperforming or that the data is really bad. Um, and actually, that may not be the case at all. What's happening is that, um, oops, got a little, there we go. Oh, I must have gone in the wrong direction. There we go. Okay. So we wonder about, well, what about reporting between facilities? Is that an issue? And well, actually, in this district, the reporting rate was 97%. I would suggest that there's something else went wrong with the data. But in fact, when we looked at, oh, sorry, there we go. When we looked at the number of facilities that reported each data element, we saw this huge variation such that when you're looking at these indicators, they become completely thrown off by the fact that the denominators and the numerators and denominators are, are on a totally different basis. So while the reporting rate uh, looks great, it's incredibly deceptive. Oh, sorry, I screwed up there. Um, so the issue is that most facilities will send in the form, but if the data element isn't filled out, then the data is no good. Okay, so that was one month's data. If you looked at data over time, you could see a similar problem. So what I have here is a graph on the left is a chart of the number of um, confirmed malaria cases. And if you look at the facilities that did not report every month, sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't, you notice there is this big increase, what looks like a big increase in cases. And that's because over time, more facilities start reporting. So this gives a very sort of uh, in inappropriate look at the data. But if we just restricted to the facilities that did report every month, you see a completely different picture. There's a small increasing trend in the cases each year and may, perhaps a large increase during the last year. And that's um, very different and perhaps useful inference, whereas the one on the left was not. So you go back to the question, could we have used that data without adjustment? Well, it depends on the question. Yes, if your question was, which part of this country has malaria? Yeah. Very, very good. So we don't need to improve the data quality. It's telling us the signal is quite accurate. But no, obviously, if the question's a little more nuanced like and complicated, like which districts within this region have the most malaria? What proportion of the suspected cases are tested? And you saw the test positivity rate. And where are the areas that have increasing malaria? We couldn't have used the data as is for that. So to try and determine when the data is good enough, we wanna consider three indexes. The first being the data element reporting rate, not the form reporting rate, the magnitude of potential data entry errors and data consistency. And I'll just give you examples of, of each. Okay. And all this is, is been done with an um, app called Magic Glasses that connects to a DHIS2 instance, uses the API to bring the data into R and R Studio does a number of statistical manipulations, and then provides some uh, data for programmatic decisions. Right? So uh, first part of our data quality dashboard is the reporting. So in this example, beginning in 
on the left in 2014, only 27% of facilities were reporting every month of the year. By 2023, that was greatly improved. Almost 91%, they would still require some adjustment in this data. And importantly, if one were looking at, oh, I wanna look at data over the last three or four years, you recognize that you would have a big problem with this bias and reporting rate because more facilities are reporting them. But this is quite helpful for, interp for interpretation. For the facilities, they get the sense that there is evidence of improving data element reporting, that's good. And for a program like malaria, they can see that the long-term trends they're gonna look at are gonna be biased unless they do something to, to account for that. Second thing we look at is just potential data entry errors by outliers. Many data sets have relatively few outliers actually, and removing those outliers greatly improves the model fitting when we want to evaluate the program. Frequently, this is done by eyeballing though. And so we have a, a little bit more rigorous program to do it. But what impressed me is that when I looked for outliers, I would find thousands of them. But if I look at the top line and I said, well, what percentage of the data had no flags for an outlier? It was actually in many cases very high, 95%, 99%. So one of the interpretations here is that for the facilities, 99% or greater of these values were good, which means there is a lot of good there despite the message that, oh, we have these outliers that need to be clean. Um, and then of course, for the, for the program who's doing an evaluation, they need to think about, well, if you add up all those outliers, what is the size of it? And this bottom uh, line here, shows what is the relative magnitude of all of those outlier values. For instance, in 2016, the outliers accounted for 10.8% of all of the, the cases. But by the time you get down to 2023, it was actually less than 1%, very positive. Lastly, we made an index of what I'm referring to as the minimum detectable change. So what we do is we fit, uh, we take the historic data for a facility and we fit a time series model to it. And based on that, that, that model would suggest, well, for each month, here's the value that it expected. And you can compare that to the actual value and you say, what is the error? What's the difference between those two? And that provides a measure of consistency. The more consistent the data, the easier it would be to distinguish any real change as opposed to just that random variation that we know happens. And if the crux of a programmatic decision relates to you know, the size of an impact, like are we looking at, do a bed, does a bed net campaign making a difference or does uh, doing um, uh, supervised supervision make an impact? We have to think about what level of change are we looking for? And this chart gives us some idea what might be possible. So in this example, due to just the natural variation in reporting, this data has a noise of around seven to 10% each year. And that says that, well, if you're going back to 2016, unless the impact that you're looking for is greater than 10%, you're probably not going to be able to use this data to detect that change. But if it is something bigger, like a, like a new bed net campaign, you likely would be able to see it. And we can also see that over time, this is improving. So we're getting increased sensitivity to be able to detect um, a change. So um, I just wanted to mention that the routine data quality audits that people are doing is, uh, is also in incredibly important. What I'm doing is based on the data that's been entered in the system, but if there are some problems in how that data is being entered, then you know, it really isn't as helpful. So having those audits at a, a facility are always really helpful. I'm sure the facilities uh, are very appreciative. But I don't think that's quite enough because you need sometimes to see this global country view of, of the data quality. So you need both of what I would call a facility level in-person look at the data and a system-wide, or we might call a desktop view of data quality. So I think DHS2 has got a potential to be a really valuable desktop analysis tool. Uh, first thing though, of course, we have to replace uh, form reporting with data element reporting, which I believe we're gonna hear in a minute, this check, <laughs> that's what's done. Um, 
outlier detection has to be done in order to really, I'd say not to not just to find the value, but to highlight all the good data to make that message clear. And then by removing bad data is improve our analysis. And then lastly, create some kind of index for that data quality that meshes with how data will be used. And typically for many things, that's how big an impact is there, how big a change is there going to be after we do something, right? So uh, just finishing up, the value of routine data depends on how well it can answer the program questions, not necessarily the quality of the data. That's a really important intermediate step. And just as an aside, I'll say I've heard from several large funders who have been providing uh, money to countries to improve data quality. And they ask, well, you know, when is enough? When can we stop with the data quality? <laughs> when, when, you know, when, when can we start using this data? And I think that that's uh, uh, it's an unfortunate question that comes because we haven't emphasized the ability to use that data already. And I think uh, what we've done here is uh, shows the potential to incorporate some of these concepts into DHIS2 as well as to leverage some external um, uh, uh, programs like R for data manipulation and statistical inference. Uh, for more information on the magic glasses, there is a larger talk that I did last year here that was about the, the whole suite. And then the, the code and, and at least a starter set of instructions are available on GitHub. Uh, I guess the presentations will be made available and those links will be, will be active. Thank you. So while sure G, we pull up his, the last bit of our presentation here, just another shameless plug that we will be going through how we've converted some of these metrics that assess is data usable, how usable is data uh, from John's work in Magic Glasses into how we can uh, put that into DHIS2 now in the next session that Jim and I will be doing. It's here, you ready? Oh, you wanna present? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Yep. Hello? Okay, great. Okay, so I'm just going to give a bit of an update in terms of uh, what we've been working on uh, within the university in terms of uh, data quality. So in particular, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today just reviewing what we call the data quality toolkit. And I'll explain the different components of that, what it comprises, and we'll give a bit of a demonstration um, about these different resources. And of course, uh, this presentation is available on Drifta, so you can, that's that kind of academy platform for managing everything. So you'll be able to access all the links that I'm showing you um, via the presentation that way. Okay, so just a bit of background in terms of where we've been focusing on for our data quality approach within uh, kind of the university. So uh, a lot of our approaches, and, and I would say the bulk of our approaches are based on these WHO data quality assurance guidelines that are available. Um, we've worked closely with WHO in, in the past, as well as currently to define this, as well as many other partners um, using the guidelines as our basis. Um, previously in DHIS2, we had this WHO data quality tool that was available for people to utilize. Um, and that proved quite popular. Um, but uh, we are kind of looking at uh, shifting away from that a bit, and I'll explain um, what that looks like a little bit more today. So there were several challenges with the WHO data quality tool that was used in the past, um, and that's why we kind of thought about re revisiting this approach. Um, well, one, it was a, a, a kind of separate app that had to be maintained, um, but we could not save any of these analyses to our dashboards. Um, on large systems, it had some challenges uh, running. And then, of course, each time you logged in, you had to know how to navigate through that interface in order to get the inputs you needed. So nothing was kind of automated in a sense for you. There was, even though things were there to review, you had to know how to use the filters and understand what a lot of this kind of specific terminology meant in order to get the outputs that you required. 
Um, so since then, um, you know, the team has been working on moving a lot of these data quality analysis features into the core of DHIS2. Um, so not having to use an external app, but actually supporting this through the different visualization tools that we offer and placing these on our dashboards. Um, so in the coming couple years, uh, and Scott can probably provide some more information on this, but, but we're kind of moving away from supporting that WHO data quality app, um, and we're supporting more of the core features um, and so, uh, kind of implementing and supporting those in the field as well. Um, there is some gaps that uh, even when, when we are moving away from that app that have been filled um, by a annual reporting tool, and I'll show that briefly as well. So to kind of package this all up, we have developed a data quality toolkit to discuss all the different kind of measures that have been introduced, the different features that are available, and there are a number of pieces of implementation guidance that are available as well. So documentation, um, and we are working on various other materials to support kind of this transition. So if you're moving from the WHO data quality tool to the core feature set, or just wanting to better understand what the current features are related to data quality, and maybe you want to perform some training, et cetera, in your own setting, um, we are also working on that. Um, there are a number of tools to support the implementation um, of this um, in, in the country as well. So there's an app for the annual data quality review. I'll, I'll demonstrate that. We have uh, some, some small tools that we're testing for minimum min max value generation, but this is a very much a work in progress. Um, we also have a, an application to support configuration of some of the outliers and measures um, in the data quality toolkit. So I think Jim and Scott will talk more about how to configure this. We've tried to streamline this process as well through some tools to help with that pro uh, kind of procedure. We then have some other templates and checklists that are kind of more on the implementation guidance side. So um, we have an SOP um, example that kind of defines, you know, at different levels within your system, what should be done, you know, by the facility, by the province, by the district, et cetera. Um, that is just meant to be a template. I'll show that as well. It's meant to be kind of taken and localized to your own context. We also have a number of implementation checklists that kind of review, well, if you're going to introduce this toolkit, what are some of the steps that you might want to consider taking? And we also have some other checklists at for lower levels, like the subnational level, for example, what type of tasks should they perform on a monthly basis um, as well? Um, so this is largely still based on the WHO data quality framework and, and was developed with a lot of support from Global Fund. Okay, so to support the implementation of this toolkit, a lot of new metrics and features have been implemented. And then this is then combined with some of the existing features. So Scott mentioned, for example, that validation notifications have been around for a significant period of time. Those have been combined with some of the new features and metrics um, that are available. So just real quickly, I, I know they'll discuss this more later on, but some of the existing metrics and features that were already there and are incorporated in the toolkit as a result. So, you know, we have our dashboards, we have notifications, things like data set completeness and timeliness, um, in, ex, internal and external consistency via validation rules, and the consistency and accuracy of population estimates. So I just have on the screen images of completeness and timeliness measures, as well as this notification. It's probably pretty small. I apologize. Um, this notifications that you can receive as a result um, of some of the actions in the system. But then a number of new metrics and features have been developed in addition to this and incorporated in the toolkit as well. So these are measures such as data element completeness, um, organization unit completeness or facilities consistently reporting, um, various types of outlier analyses um, that are available, including the outlier tables that have just been uh, released in the new version of DHIS2, um, consistency of related data using scatter plots, and consistency over time using year-over-year -year comparisons. So what we've done is take the kind of previously existing measures, the new measures and metrics and features and functionality, and just described how you can kind of implement this um, in your own system. So what I want to do is just go over these different components really quickly. Um, and all the links for everything that I'm showing um, is in this presentation. So of course you can contact one of us to discuss further, but you can also access these if you want um, a bit of a broader view um, on your own time as well. Okay, so um, to start, we have a demo instance that demonstrates the various functionality of the different data quality metrics and features that are available inside of DHIS2. And I'm just gonna walk through real quick three dashboards that we've made for demonstration purposes. So the first one here, um, and maybe I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Okay, um, it's a 
core data quality dashboard, it combines measures from several different programs, essentially, and it includes many of those metrics and measures that I have discussed um, previously. I'll walk through that in a moment. We also have another dashboard for kind of the facility level, and I'll zoom in on a facility and show you what some of the metrics are there. Um, and then we also built one specifically for one program. So taking the same principles that we apply across, you know, multi kind of program analysis and focusing in this case for immunization, taking those same principles and applying it on a per, per program basis, uh, which we know can be important as well. So we can see that some of the measures here on the screen here, I have completeness. I have on the left side here, my traditional kind of uh, reporting rate um, completeness here. Um, but then on the uh, other side here, I have data element completeness. So this is evaluating you know, within those reports, John mentioned it previously just uh, now when he was talking about magic glasses, about looking at data element completeness. And this can be defined, um, you know, for as many data elements as necessary. Of course, our recommendation is to select a core group, especially if you're looking at this from a systemic point of view. But there are also kind of some ad hoc ways to measure data element completeness as well. If you just want to take, let's say, everything from a data set and view the completeness measures for a particular month, um, that can be done uh, relatively quickly as well through creation of a charter table as an example. Um, we have some of the other measures here, such as facilities consistently reporting. So, you know, if those facilities are consistently reporting values within a 12 month period, um, we've been able to kind of combine all of this together. Um, so you can look at your reporting rates, um, your data element completeness, your facilities consistently reporting on time. And I apologize, I know I'm going through this a little bit quickly. And we do it for a number of different measures, right? So um, you could have different variables um, viewing this information. Okay. Uh, we also have these scatter plots that are looking at consistency of related data. Um, this is, uh, you know, if you've looked at the WHO data quality tool before, this is just kind of a different way of presenting this scatter plot, um, but it presents similar information in terms of identification of outliers. Um, the same features that are available within the scatter plot in the visualizer are also available on the dashboard for these. So you can zoom in and look at particular um, values of interest in order to determine what this relationship is telling you. Um, things like dropout rate um, as well, um, which is available. And that, this has been available for some time. Um, this is not necessarily a new measure that's available, but something that is uh, important for a number of reasons. Uh, consistency over time. So these are these year over year charts that um, Scott was referring to earlier. These uh, plot the consistency over time for um, one particular variable over a, a period that you define. And we can see some examples of kind of quick outliers identifications um, in this uh, chart that's here. Uh, and then we have different types of outlier analyses available as well. So for example, e exclusion of outliers, what percentage of your um, data for a particular time period um, is outliers, what particular, uh, what percentage of that is outliers. We're also then able to identify what those particular outliers are. And then of course, perform uh, re rectifying actions. So for example, here's a table that lists the specific outliers um, within the period that you've selected. Um, so you can follow up on those values. So we can see, for example, quite um, some quite large ones that have been identified um, as a result of that uh, process. And this is just available on the dashboard when a person logs in, for example. Um, just real quick to show the facility one, I'll just zoom in on a facility here. Okay, so we also uh, built an example dashboard just to show what this would look like if you're kind of drilling into the data a bit more. So if you want to view data on a facility level, for example, let's say you're in a district and you want to view specific information on each facility in your district. Um, so it has a number of the same measures, but just presented a bit differently. Um, and, and we've also added some additional chart types that would be more relevant perhaps at this level. So we still have kind of the same types of information, but now we have a bit more kind of granular information because we're looking at a facility. So for example, completeness rates. Um, and real quickly, you can identify which reports you are missing um, for a particular period. Um, same type of charts, um, but now we see how these outliers are kind of impacting um, the information when the values are quite low in comparison um, for the rest of the, the months. Um, you still have things like outliers. Here we have, a, here we're displaying a calculated threshold against the actual reported value for example, which we didn't have in the other, other dashboard um, just because of the way the data is aggregated. And then lastly, we have uh, an example applied to the program. So similarly, we can take all these values and measures 
And you can see here, I have a lot more information on immunization specifically, as I've selected a subset of uh, data elements and, and uh, indicators that would be useful. Um, so for example, we have some additional information, coverage rates above 100%, et cetera, and some other types of information focusing on a particular program. So the idea is to make those principles as generic as possible, and then apply them to programs um, as needed. Um, we also have these uh, annual report applications. So those of you familiar with the WHO data quality tool um, would know that it has a, a kind of facilities or uh, ability to produce an annual report. Um, so this is a separate application, whereas everything else I just showed you was part of the core feature set um, of DHIS2. Um, but uh, this is available now to kind of supplement that functionality that was there previously. Um, this runs uh, a lot better than before. Um, and uh, there are some more features here that allow you to view the data um, in a similar way um, as, as was in that framework. So um, the same types of measures um, in those four domains that were on the tool, for those of you familiar, um, are also here. Um, and you can review that. You can add in your comments. Um, you can save this and you can send it out uh, to people as necessary. Now, to kind of support the implementation of all of this, um, we have developed uh, some detailed documentation to kind of support, you know, how are these measures configured? What do these measures mean? You know, when is it kind of most appropriate to use some of these different measures? Um, in addition to some of the implementation guidance um, that I will describe. So we have information um, both on the data entry side, as well as the analysis side in terms of, you know, what these measures are, how you design them, how you configure them. So we have kind of detailed guidance, um, you know, on how you actually make this. I think Scott and Jim will walk through some of this uh, later on. Um, but then in terms of, you know, what do you actually do um, in DHIS2 to get these to work, um, to allow you to kind of follow along with this and, and actually configure this um, in your own system um, based on the measures that you select um, for use. Too much. And similar on the analysis side. So a lot of the measures that I discussed were a bit more on the analysis side. Um, and we have similarly uh, quite detailed guides in terms of how to set all of these things up what everything means, how to interpret that information, um, you know, and various, we've tried to incorporate a couple different examples um, to cover uh, a wide variety of, of use cases um, in relation to this. Some of these are just kind of creating charts and things like that. Some of it is a bit more involved in terms of the configuration. And we do try to walk, uh, walk you through all of that um, uh, through this process, for example, creating predictors and things of that nature. Supplemental to the documentation, we have some additional kind of implementation artifacts um, that are available uh, for review. So this is an example SOP. Um, we know that there, there are many places that have been requesting this type of kind of standard operating procedure. Now, this is just meant to be a template and, you know, give ideas of where to get started. It's by no means meant to replace national SOPs or, or take over for anything that's already existing. But if you don't know where to get started, it might be a nice place to refer to um, and give you some ideas so we have a basically identification or what we've outlined here um, is kind of responsibilities at different levels um, of the health system, um, as well as kind of re review of the various tools and measures um, that are available um, based on what is selected as every country might have some variation in terms of the measures we're reviewing on a routine basis. Um, so the idea is to kind of identify specifically if they identify, you know, outliers or if they identify data that's incorrect you know, what would be the follow-up action, for example, um, at different levels of the system. Um, in addition to this, we have some kind of, uh, after you perform trainings and uh, other types of operations, this is just an example checklist at the facility level or district level, perhaps, um, where you can just measure behavioral change in relation to data, to data quality, or just kind of sequence the activities that people should generally be following along on a routine basis, month to month basis, let's say, or weekly if you're collecting the data more, more, more often. Um, and then lastly, to supplement all of this and to try and bring everything together, we have this, uh, this task checklist. And the idea behind this is to take all of these different pieces of disparate information, because we do understand that it's not as uh, well connected as it could be, um, but then trying to bring all this together in terms of how would you introduce this to a ministry? Um, how would you decide on different measures to utilize? Um, what are some kind of rational ways to actually start configuring this and introduce it and train um, others um, in order to do that. Um, we also have kind of estimates of time for, for some of these activities as well. So we just this is just presented in, in kind of the order we suggest. 
Um, and, and we kind of discussed, you know, if you're going to do um, some of these measures, what, what is rational to, to kind of uh, work through at this point in time. So the idea behind this is to kind of give as much information as possible. And it's meant to be reference information, right? None of it is meant to be taken exactly as it is necessarily. Um, but you can take this, you can have a look, you can modify this to your own context. Of course, in the case of the demo and the documentation, we do give very specific information in terms of how to configure things. And if you go into the demo and you want to kind of understand more, how is one particular item, like data element completeness, for example, how does that actually work? How do I make it work in DHIS2? Um, also, some information in terms of interpreting that information, like facilities consistently reporting. Maybe that's not familiar for everybody. Um, it might need to be explained um, to the ministry, for example. Um, so we also have some, some information on that. So, so the whole idea behind that toolkit is just trying to bring all this different documentation and items and the demo and everything together, um, and hopefully to help you all um, you know, implement uh, data quality measures using these core features in DHIS2. Okay, so that's it for me. Thank you very much. All right, so we've seen that there are quite a lot of innovations. So we've seen that there's quite a lot of innovation going on around the DHIS2 community uh, when it comes to data quality. Hopefully, you've been a bit inspired, maybe a little bit empowered knowing that we're all struggling with this and we can all address it together. All of the innovations that you've seen have been publicly shared. You know who you've seen their faces. You can go and talk to them and you can use Magic Glasses. You can use Coffee's Supervision Support app. Uh, we can get in touch with Reddit and you can use his uh, uh, reporting completeness uh, checking app. There you have tools. You can address data quality, both from external support as well within the DHIS2 native functionality. We have a couple of minutes. Are there any questions on any of the presentations? Yeah. Yeah. What's the question on Zoom? Yeah. So the question is, are we, um, what's happening to the WHO data quality app? So as I mentioned earlier, we are not able to support the WHO data quality app any longer. We are maintaining it through version 41, but probably starting in version 42, which is this time next year, we will no longer be supporting that with any continued maintenance. Honestly, the code base is too old. I don't even have developers who can look at that code base anymore. It's really difficult to update it and maintain it. But the good news is we have replicated all of those functionalities in the data visualizer app and in addition to the um, WHO annual report app that Surajit was just demoing. So that's able to give you the WHO data quality annual report. That's very important to many countries. And then all of that routine data quality analysis that you were using in the WHO data quality app can be done in the data visualizer application. You can save all of those analytics, just as Surajit was pointing out. You can put them on a dashboard and to make it much more accessible than what the original app was uh, uh, presenting to the user. Yeah, there's a question here. Pass this mic around. Good afternoon. I'm Angelica Talibergenova from the UNDP Global Fund Partner Team. Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you, everybody, for these very interesting and relevant presentations. Um, I have one question and one comment. Uh, my question is, uh, it's great to see all these resources. I was wondering if you already have a pool of trained experts in these new features, new tools in different regions whom uh, countries could reach out to. Uh, that's a question and basically how to get that information. And the second point is just a comment. I am really impressed by the um, project on the data completeness app implemented in Ethiopia. And I find one of the really powerful features of it is that it's actually the primary users themselves who get these data completeness reports and who are empowered basically to change things. So it's not, we are not talking about a policing layer. Of course, the other layer will be required as well, uh, but it's the primary users who get that and act upon it. Thank you. So uh, to uh, answer your first question is actually all of these data quality metrics that we've been working on um, uh, are really very new. 
I mean, I mean, I think we've only maybe had to do a pilot in Rwanda. <laughs> and then other than that, there's just a handful of us who are probably able to configure it. Now, just to point out, Jim and I will be demoing it literally in 15 minutes on how to configure everything. So you can all become experts <laughs> if you come to the next session. Uh, but no, we do have a bit of a strategy and a work plan to continue to roll out all of this um, capacity to the HIST groups, as well as ministries of health or anybody, any other ministries that want to join in. Um, we have some planning sessions on trying to orchestrate that uh, this week, actually this afternoon. And so I think you're going to be seeing a lot more news and information coming from us about how we're going to have a, a, an implementation strategy for all of this new stuff that we've been just uh, communicating and demoing. Where's your question? Yeah, just. Oh yeah, there is a there is a data quality academy. So if you like the sound of my voice, you can do that. It's online, um, and uh, we also have one that's in person. We're planning. We think we're planning on doing some more in person academies as well to make sure that we cover all these. We'll also be updating the material for the academy based upon all of the new stuff that you've seen here. Yeah, thanks, Coffee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for presentations. Uh, my name is Shanawaz. I'm from WHO country office, Islamabad. Uh, my question related to the data quality. I think uh, the usage of data is one of the quality of data. If it is usable or not, and especially in the settings where uh, we have issues of internet infra infrastructure at lower level in health facilities, smaller health facilities, when we are going to conduct the any assessment or maybe supervision visit. So if we are not giving them proper feedback, that data will not be uh, translated into action properly. So in, in DHIS2 perspective, especially uh, I'm talking about the supervision and the DQAs, in, in, especially in the first presentation. So can we integrate some other mechanisms, for example, social media uh, connections, WhatsApp, uh, PDF reporting, or uh, maybe feedback like that, that target uh, audience who is at health facility should should get uh, or written and documented uh, feedback uh, in order to correct the action uh, to make it more uh, useful about that. So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really excellent point. Feedback mechanisms are like, are fundamentally critical to this. We have to deliver the data quality to where people are spending their time and where they can address it. That's not always a DHIS2 dashboard, right? Most of the time it's actually not a DHIS2 dashboard. There are feedback apps within DHS2. So I mentioned the validation rule notifications that can be sent to someone's email. You can also send it via SMS. There are also connections of DHS2 to WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook Messenger, where we can be sending data quality alerts and notifications and analytics to the end users. We have to make sure that we're sending the data to where people are able to access it. And hiding it behind a DHS2 dashboard is not the answer to that. We, because if we could dashboard our way out of these problems, then we would have already solved the world's issues. So we've got plenty of dashboards, but people aren't looking at them. So one more time, uh, one more question, and then we'll have to. Just a quick one, and congratulations on the work incorporating all of this into the core. I think it's brilliant. Um, one of the issues is that outliers aren't always a data quality problem. They can be genuine. And one of the cultural things I've seen happen in countries is that facilities are then put under pressure to just get rid of their outliers. There's, as far as I know, there's no system right now for flagging that this has been investigated and validated. Is that a problem that you guys have given some thought to? Are there any ideas in terms of how to handle that? Yeah. It's an exposed wire here. I'm not sure how that's, how that's my head. Um, yeah, really, really good point. So outliers are a very complex situation. All of the outlier detection that we were illustrating was based upon normally distributed data. And that becomes a problem, as John was pointing out, for seasonal data, right? Seasonal data is not normally distributed. Uh, and so what we're actually starting to investigate is incorporating more advanced time series modeling into DHIS2 so that we can automate, so that we can remove the, the, the uh, 
the time series decomposition where you know you factor out the seasonality of the data and then you're able to do outlier analysis on top of that based upon the time series model. Um, so that's kind of next up. And then the, then the next question is, okay, we found the outliers. How do we calculate our key, our key popular or our uh, impact indicators with those outliers? Do we leave the outliers in? Do we get rid of them? Do we just delete them? Or do we try to impute the a more appropriate value based upon that? And that's again where the time series models becomes more uh, uh, useful than so that we can potentially get to a place where we could potentially we could potentially produce uh, 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 an indicator that imputes uh, outliers or missing some missing values uh, um, instead of just leaving them in there and letting them skew off our, does that make sense? Does that really answer the question? Kinda, not really. But there's also the third scenario, which is the outlier is actual real data. Yeah. So you've had a market day or a market, some, some, some kind of annual festival, there's been a huge, you've done a huge family planning campaign and there's been a huge surge and they'll look into this and this is actually real data. So it's not just seasonality, it's not, this is, and is there a way of flagging that we don't want to compensate for that? We don't want to impute, this is real data. And I guess that's the issue. How do you separate those outliers in the system? How can you mark and reassure that this is okay to use? Well, I mean, it's a it's a good point. So, uh, fuck this time. Uh, currently, currently we um, currently we don't really mark any outliers as anything in DHS two. It's just sitting there as a really over, like huge number. Um, so, I think that there is an interesting uh, perspective on and and some work they do this in South Africa where they do. Um, uh, mark data values. There's a mark to follow up functionality in DHIS2 on the aggregate data forms that virtually no one except South Africa uses. And whenever it breaks, they're the only ones who ever complain about it. Um, so we keep it working for them. Um, but you can flag data values in the data entry form in DHIS2. And then you can actually even look at the historical trend of that data value directly from the aggregate data entry form. And you can even write a comment about the data value. And then you can do a mark to follow up analysis and see any comments that have been written about any data values as a system administrator, so at national level. And so that way, if you do flag data, if you do flag outliers, again, something South Africa is doing, if you flag outliers, then you go directly into the data entry form. You say, this is an outliers, you star it, you write a comment. And then when you're doing your annual, you, when you're doing your uh, higher level data quality review, you can run your mark to follow up analysis uh, that will give you a list of all of the values that have been marked by someone at, on the data entry form, and then you would be able to potentially do some assessment. But again, it's only one country that we know of that's actually doing this, and they've been doing it for a long time, um, and it's, it's seemingly well institutionalized into their, their, their processes. But if this was something that more countries wanted to do, we can certainly improve the functionality to uh, make it easier to mark data values for either correction or for that saying alert, uh, notifying the end user that uh, that this is an acceptable value. Um, yeah, good point. I think we're going to have to call it at that. Um, so uh, thanks for coming, and uh, see you in the next one.